and we are looking at an honour that comes straight from Australia. Yes, one of the Commonwealth countries, a little colony of Australia. Um, really, it's a country um, of Australia, but we're still connected to you guys because we're still part of the Commonwealth and uh, we honour that. And this afternoon, we are looking at Pathfinder Honour, looking at Australian Aboriginal law. Now, Pastor Dayon is probably, uh, you're probably wondering why he's got Pastor Richie. Well, I am actually an Aboriginal person of Australia, and I'm here to share with you this honour that comes from Australia, that is actually goes around the world and has come to your lounge rooms, your computers this afternoon. So let's just have a look here, and you can see some of the pictures. This is some Aboriginal art right here, and I'm wondering if you'd look at that, and perhaps you can talk to your parents or whoever's in the room with you or even have a talk to yourself. There's an idea. Um, <laughs> that's what Pastor Dayon does a lot. He talks to himself. He does, actually. Um, <laughs> he does, actually. And see here, you can have a look at this Aboriginal. This is dot art. Um, and so someone has sat down and, and they've each one of those dots is their hand movement onto the, um, onto the canvas there. And you can actually see some animals can anyone see any animals and perhaps drop it in the um the comment line what animals that you can sort of see there um there's also a tree there a very famous tree in australia uh, it's called the yeah, Richie, uh, uh, yeah. i just want to make sure that everybody picked up that uh, please everybody use your chat sections and comment sections wherever you are whether you're on facebook or you are in a zoom room and which animals and uh, you know nature objects uh, you see so we can Share that with Pastor Richie. Uh, Pastor Richie, the answers are coming in. In fact, they're flying in. Uh, we Tell have what? Uh, we have a lizards. We have a crab. We have a kangaroo. We have a, a pelican. Uh, also, uh, more comments are coming from the Facebook, uh, which are saying uh, similar things. As, uh, um, uh, 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 somebody says, uh, somebody said, oh, uh, it's definitely a bird. Uh, also, there are a few people who said thank you, Pastor Richie, for being so late with us. Thank you. Uh, they appreciate your commitment. No, I wasn't late. I was here on time. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, just joking. Sure. Okay. <laughs> there is a tree there. If you have a look on that, that's a tree there. It's called a Boaz tree. I think you might have, I think we had the South Africans on. Uh, do, do they have Boaz trees in South Africa? I'm, I'm not sure, but this tree there, you can see sort of fat and it's got arms that are hanging out there. And uh, that tree in Australia, um, there's actually a, a, a famous story about Burke and Wills, some Australian explorers that um, came to a tree, a dig tree it was. And, and you can actually, they, there's even jails that they've made out of these trees. They've hollowed it out and put a gate and a lock on it and stuck people in. So there's, an, uh, there's a little uh, interesting fun fact for you this afternoon. Let's, uh, let's keep moving on. Um, now let's work out how to do this. There we go. There we go, here we go. I wanna share with you something that is called the acknowledgement of country. And uh, it's, it's, it's something that we do here in Australia. I'm not sure if many different countries have different customs and ways of expressing themselves at the beginning of, of meetings. Um, uh, and this is a way that Australia, uh, within its parliaments, within it's meetings, um, even church meetings when we have conference constituencies or um, in schools, whenever there's an, uh, uh, dignitaries involved or an important event, an opening of a school, uh, a building, um, we actually take the time to uh, do what is called the acknowledgement of country. Now you can see that on the, on the screen there and uh, this pays honour and respect to the Indigenous people of Australia and their connection to country. Now that's an interesting term, connection to country. That's actually um, what, how Aboriginal people, and, and as we go through this afternoon's honour, it uh, you'll come to understand that um, uh, the Australian Indigenous people, the um, Aboriginal people, the First Nations people, now I've just used three terms there, and they're all correct, um, and it depends who you are to, or how you could be use those different terms. Aboriginal, um, you could use indigenous, 
or you could call yourself a First Nations person. Now, some people, they'll get upset if you call them one, if you call them another, or if you call them late for dinner. Like myself, you'll get annoyed. But like, the thing is that these speak to who these people are and they identify with the land, with country. Um, so when they talk about uh, welcomed country, it's, it's their land, it's, the, it's their, um, their, they use another name, nation, um, and, uh, and we'll share with you with that. And I thought I'd read you this. This is actually what our Seventh-day Adventist church has produced for our schools, our hospitals, our retirement villages, anywhere that we have, um, in, even in our churches when there's, when there's programs on, our church has produced this document um, to express as Seventh-day Adventists, um, and even you can use this at Pathfinder gatherings and adventurer gatherings, to express um, our acknowledgement of the Indigenous peoples um, of this land and the country that we actually would be meeting on. And um, there's, there's a question that I have for you in your worksheets there, is what is the difference between the terms welcome to country and acknowledgement of country? Now, this is what I'm about to share with you is acknowledgement of country, but there is another one that is called a welcome to country. Now, here we are in Australia, and you come into my, my church here, where I'm, I'm situated at the moment recording this, um, as an Aboriginal person, I can get up and do an acknowledgement of country. You can get up and do an acknowledgement of country, but I can't do a welcome to country if there was an Indigenous person who came from this area where this church is, in this surrounding area, if they were from the tribe or from the people grouping, that were here in this area, they would be invited to actually welcome us all, me included, sorry, me included, um, to this venue, um, and they would do a welcome to country. So I, if I was to take you up to where I'm from, from my area of where I was originally from and my people, my tribe and everything is from, I wouldn't do an acknowledgement to country, I would do a welcome to country. And so they're, they're the two differences. And sometimes in Australia, people get even mixed up with, oh, uh, you're gonna do a welcome to country. Oh, no, well, I can't do a welcome to country. I can do an acknowledgement of country because this is not where I'm from. I'm from up the road. Um, but this afternoon, I would like to actually, uh, at the beginning of this, uh, this honor, uh, and our, our commencement of it, I would like to actually just read through to you what the acknowledgement of country is so that you can experience it um, as it is. And it's a, it's a, it's a good little um, um, document that our church has produced uh, with the Indigenous um, um, work that, that we have in this country. Um, we have a department in all of our conferences and and, and at the Australia Union, we have a department called the ATSIM department. I'm gonna share with you more about that. And the union and the church have worked with the ATSIM department, the indigenous people, um, to bring this document to you. I read to you this Bible verse, just to start us off with. In Psalms 24 and verse one, we're reminded that the earth and everything in and on it belongs to the Lord the whole world and its people belong to him. And so this afternoon, I'd like to, at the commencement of our meeting together, I would like to, today I'd like to acknowledge God as our savior and savior Jesus Christ. We acknowledge you Lord, because you are the creator, provider and supreme owner of all things. We also respectfully acknowledge the indigenous people who are the traditional custodians of this land. We pay tribute to elders, past and present, and acknowledge that they have cared for this country over countless generations. We recognize the continuing contribution that the indigenous people make to the life 
of this region and pray that we can work together to leave a legacy of reconciliation, justice and hope for all future Australians. And so that's our acknowledgement of country uh, that, um, that for this afternoon. And if you want one of these, um, let Pastor Dayon know. And I think we could work out um, to get one of these um, over to you if you'd like it for your own um, pack or your, your, for, your, for your church or, or if you're just interested in these kind of things. Let's, um, let's continue to move on. I'd like to also start, I've, give, I've done acknowledgement of country, recognising the Indigenous people of Australia and their continuing contribution. But I'd also like to make a statement to you about who I am. And here you see a picture of myself and I actually came to Wales to do, and some of you guys might have been able to be there. I know that um, Dayan was there and he brought his friend Roy the kangaroo. And uh, I don't know where Roy's disappeared to. I hope he hasn't uh, been uh, eaten. Roy, 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 he retired. Uh, he now uh, is uh, resting. Resting. He's, yeah, he's, yeah, he was probably let down a little. Um, here is a picture of me at your last campery, or it might have been a few camperies ago. And here is a picture of my daughter, or my daughters, sorry. And this is um, a picture of my daughter, Zara and my newest addition to our family, and that is Nova. She is actually five weeks old yesterday. So that's right, Pastor Dayon has actually asked me to come and spend time with you when I'm still on my paternity leave, my, my break from work. But that's okay, that's okay. But I wanna just say this to you, my heritage is Aboriginal. My heritage is Indigenous Australian. That's, that's my heritage of who I am. Uh, my culture is Australian. And if you know any Australians, you know what, what they, they love the beach. They love a good barbecue. Um, they love the, the sun and the sand. Uh, Australians love um, good culture. So my heritage is Aboriginal. My culture is Australian. But I want to tell you this afternoon that my identity is Jesus Christ. My identity isn't found in who I am as an Aboriginal person. My identity isn't found in who I am as an Australian. My identity, young people, is found in Jesus Christ. And, and I want you to understand that concept. And I want you to think about that in your own context. Where's your identity today? It, when you work out and when you discover that your identity is Jesus Christ. When you understand that in Christ, I'm a new creation, the old is gone and the new has come. I want to tell you young people, pathfinders, listen to me. It's a game changer. It's a game changer. And it was a game changer in my life when I realized and I came to the understanding that Jesus Christ was indeed my identity. Because, you know, there's in this world, there's lots of things when it comes to your heritage about racism um, with cultural divides and, and groupings and, oh, you don't fit in here and you don't fit in there. But when you, your identity and who you are is found in Jesus Christ, you can go anywhere. There's a song about that. Anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go. Anyway, quiz question for you guys this afternoon because you guys are great and you guys would know this guy because he's one of your countrymen. Um, and that's one of your boats that is a picture of. But here is the quiz question. Let's go. Um, here we go. What year did European colonization commence in Australia? This is for the fast money. All right, we have a question there. I'm sure our pathfinders know this. Uh, um, so I you, don't. Uh, uh, you probably right. Uh, don't oh. be too hard on us, Pastor Ricci. This is why uh, we're doing this. All right, uh, Pastor Ricci, there is no comments coming in. Maybe Anyone some... want to have a crack at it? Uh, take a guess. Take a guess. Um, uh, but as, as we're waiting, people are writing comments and saying, Pastor Ricci, you have beautiful kids, uh, just to let you Thank know. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 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 nobody's I, writing. I actually have... Oh, um, 
1642 or 1788? 1642 or uh, 1824? 18 or 1844. Eight, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that would... Yeah, this is a disappointment. Let's, um, let's go to... The 26th of January, 1788. Whoever was that? Yeah, we had, a, we, had a couple of, we, had, we had a couple of 1788. I'm sure they Google it, but who cares? We have yeah, I think, I think you were, your fingers were doing that. Yeah, okay. Doesn't matter. You are correct, and you go to the top of the class. See Diane afterwards, and he'll give you a little prize. Okay, thanks. Um, yes, yeah, uh, the 6, 26th of January, uh, 1788. So I don't know if you guys have been down to a place called Portsmouth. Uh, Portsmouth. Portsmouth? Is that how you say it? We say it's a Portsmouth. Portsmouth. Okay. Well, we'll we'll go with that. Have you been there? Have uh, you actually been down there? Yes, because, we did. Because closer to the date that you were talking about in the, that first person, 1787, um, there was more than 14 like 50, close to 1,500 people got put onto some boats, men, women, and children. Uh, most were British. There were some Africans and Americans and even some French convicts. And uh, if you know your, your history about what happened with Australia, um, people would steal bread and they get sent to Australia. Um, they would, all these bad things were happening. You were sent off to different colonies of the British Empire. Well, here, these guys were sent, and after a voyage of three months, the, um, the, the first fleet arrived in Botany Bay on the 24th of January, 1788, um, and met, and, the, and the, here, the Aboriginal people, who they say, and we, as Seventh-day Adventists, we believe in uh, the uh, a creation and, and the world being uh, a certain age, um, they, they often say that the Aboriginal people are uh, a people who have been here for 40,000 years. Um, but here, um, the Aboriginal people who hadn't been disturbed for a long time now had your British boats arrive. And it's actually interesting because they actually arrived into um, a place called Botany Bay. And um, here, they met the Aboriginal people and there was an uneasy standoff. Now, this was at a place called La Perouse. And the reason it's called La Perouse is because on the 26th of, of January, the English moved their ships around into um, Port Jackson um, and as the French ships were coming in. That's right, Australia actually could be, I could be talking to you in French right now, but the British laid their flag in, in Port Jackson. They put up a flag and they claimed Australia um, or they claimed this place is not being void and of, of nothingness. And they said, this is now British soil. And so Australia was claimed on the 26th of January, 1788. Aboriginal people, Indigenous people, First Nations people had been here for a long time before. And that date to this day causes a whole lot of um, turmoil in this country uh, with its Indigenous peoples, with its Aboriginal people. There's a real date because this is a day called Australia Day that we celebrate here in Australia. And, and there's, when you come in close to Australia Day, the television is talking about it. The radio stations are on about it. They're all talking about this date and that we shouldn't be celebrating this day because um, some say that this is actually invasion day when we were invaded. This country was invaded by the British. Um, and, and, and so the arguments go back and forth and they say we should choose another date to celebrate the uniqueness of who we are as Australians 200 years on from that date and what makes us Australians. And, and, and here's one for you. There's people out there, they get on there and they talk about, why don't we make it on May 8? Why do you think they say May 8 would be day on? Yeah, we, we have no clue, Pastor Richard. Because the Australians, when I call you my friend, I refer to you as my day on? Yes, I'm here, I'm here. 
What do I refer to you when you're my friend as an Australian? I call you mate. No, you call me mate. Mate, there you go. So May 8th, mate, is what some people want to change the date of celebrating Australia and who we are as a nation to. That's a bit funny. How many Aboriginal tribes? And you've got your worksheets there, so you can be working through this as, as or you can go back and continue to uh, look at uh, this video again if you would really like to. Um, but here, how many Aboriginal tribes already occupied Australia uh, before and when, uh, and when European uh, uh, settlement arrived? Um, Australia is famous for being known as the oldest known civilization on earth, um, the indigenous people. Uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. See, here in Australia, we, we, this talks about the Aboriginal law is, the, is, is, is actually the honour that you're doing. But in Australia, we also recognise as part of the Indigenous people of Australia, the Torres Strait Islander people, which is up above Queensland there between Papua New Guinea and, and Australia. There's, there's a set of islands that are Australian territory that they actually call um, the Torres Strait. And then we also have some, some South Sea Islanders that also identify as indigenous that were brought in from some of the um, islands off the coast, like uh, the Solomon Islands and places like that that were brought to Australia to be cane cutters and stuff. And so the reach of who we are as indigenous people um, reached to different areas of our coastal, our coastal reach. And when the Europeans came to Australia, there was over 500 indigenous nations. Now remember I was talking about nations, countries, areas, tribes. And if you look at on the screen there, you can see all those different colors there um, on there represent different tribes, nations, countries within the nation of Australia um, at, um, when Europeans first arrived in Australia. Now, it's interesting that the British actually got here because it's also disputed that the, the, the Portuguese and, the, and, and I think even the, um, the Spanish or were, were also traveling up and then the Dutch were, were, were traveling around this country. And, and yet the, it was the British who landed um, Old England's flag, the standard of the brave, is it? No, is that someone else? Um, I don't know. Um, but also there was estimated 800 dialects, languages within those 500 indigenous nations that you see there in the corner. Um, when you talk about country, it has a profound spiritual, it's about having a profound spiritual connection to the land. Aboriginal law and spirituality is intertwined with the land, people and creation people in creation, and this forms their culture and sovereignty. The land, indigenous people, Aboriginal, First Nations people, believe that the land is Mother Earth. The land is the mother and steeped in their culture. But this also gives them the responsibility to care for, for the land. Here in Sydney, where I'm from, um, or, or where I'm, well, I'm from Brisbane, really, and but where I'm working at the moment, the Aurora people um, were, the, were the coastal Aboriginal people in this area when, when the first fleet arrived, um, the Aurora Nation. And um, these were the, the, the people when the British arrived here in the Bay of Port Jackson. Aboriginal communities um, were both generous and um, a bit scared towards colonialists. Um, many places around the harbour uh, remain important hunting and fishing. And if you've seen the beautiful Sydney Harbour, you would know how beautiful it is. And some of these places still hold real significance, importance of fishing and camping grounds, um, even through to today being cultural sites of significance. Um, my actual place from where I'm from um, is actually, if you go up into Queensland, if you go from Sydney here, you'd go a thousand kilometers to Brisbane, and then you go another 600, 800 kilometers on, so 1800 kilometers up to a place called Rockhampton, 
and then you turn off there and you head in, in towards the centre of Australia for about another, I don't know, a couple of hours or so. There's a little place there called Warrabinda, and that's where I was from. Now, Warrabinda was a government reserve, and I'll, I'll talk to you some more about missions and government reserves and how the Indigenous people, the Aboriginal people, were actually cared for by the white people um, in such places like this. That's where I'm from. My traditional or my tribal name is actually uh, the Rumble um, people. That's where my, my, my tribe is from. The totem, I believe, is the lily pad. Um, so I, I don't, yep, that's what I understand it to be. And this encompasses about 4,000 square miles is, is the nation or where my tribe, my country, um, is that's about 10,000 uh, kilometers and, it, and, and it, it stretches central Queensland to the and even out takes to Yapoon and 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 um, out to the Fitzroy River and to Great Keppel Island as well it takes an island on off the coast there what are Aboriginal totems um, Aboriginal totems here I just shared with you what mine is, and I've put a picture there of some lilies. I don't know if that's a particular lily, but there's a picture of lily there. Um, but uh, Aboriginal totems um, are natural objects, plants or animals, that in, are inherited by members of the clan or the family as their spiritual emblem. So Aboriginal people are very spiritual. Um, this speaks to the totems and to the spiritual ways that they, uh, they, they, they think and they, they act and, and, and actually dictates. Um, and we'll talk some more about the um, dream time. But uh, here, the, they, the totems are each either creatures or, or, or animals which are creatures <laughs> or plants or, or, and you can see a number of them there. See a crocodile there. And there's some pictures of some painted um, indigenous art. There of some, some platypus or platypi we, to use a, um, the group name. Uh, kangaroo there, there's a, a snake there. There's, there's a, little, um, a little, little animal there. What do you call it? a little, um, looks like a little sugar glider or, or um, there's a goanna there, turtle. Um, many of these things are, are the to totems. How many totems can an Aboriginal person have? Um, most times there's normally about four totems that are represented to, to an Indigenous person, an Aboriginal person. Um, each one is about four, which represents their nation, one totem for their nation, one totem for their clan, their family group, as well as a personal totem that they have. Now, here's a question for you. We're up to another quiz question. What do I mean, Pathfinders, what do I mean, and if there's any adventurers, um, when I use the term bush tucker? What does bush tucker mean? All right, we have Patrick. Damn. What is bush tucker? Um, it is. Uh, let me. Let's have a good guess because I'm. I'm. Uh, well, unless you start have a crack, have a guess. Okay. Let's uh, see how good you are. Uh, it means. It means. What are they saying? Because uh, uh, there's a little picture there that might give away something. All right. Looks like uh, a bit of chewing gum. Okay. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Uh, hey, Richie, uh, a meeting. Okay. Uh, uh, they're saying uh, a snail, uh, a worm, um, a type of a worm. Yeah, that, that's what's on the picture. But when I use the word bush tucker, it actually refers to, you're right, wor that worm, which was a witchetty grub um, coming from the witchetty tree and the roots and stuff that they, they dig out and eat. Tastes like chicken. Uh, needs a bit of salt. Um, but, uh, no, I haven't really eaten one. Um, but the uh, bush tucker 
actually refers is the Australian name given to foods that have come from the bush, um, whether it be uh, the animals or whether it be the, the, the seeds and the berries and, 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 the, and the nuts and stuff that you find in the Australian landscape or in the Australian bush, um, bush tucker is there. I've talked to um, Indigenous people who say that when they go out, out in the bush, you, and you know what, here's the truth, hashtag real talk now, I would actually go hungry in the bush. Um, I'd be looking for the signs to McDonald's or something. But I've talked to Indigenous people who say, when they go out in the bush and I can be with them, they say, this is like the shopping centre. It's like you're walking down through the, the food mall. They, they can see it all over the place. I'm looking going, where is this? And then they can come to you with a handful of, of, of bush tucker like this. And, and, it, and it actually, it looks good there in the picture. And it actually, it tastes pretty, pretty good as well. Um, also called bush food is the food that native Australians are used to sustain um, by the indigenous people, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. But it can also describe native flora and fauna used for culinary or medical purposes, regardless of the, con of the culture. So this bush tucker is, is not just food, but it's also medicine and can be used as medicine. Let's continue to move along. Name three different bush tuckers, and this is in your worksheet, uh, bush tucker groups, where you, where you might get them and how to you prepare them. Now I'm gonna help you this afternoon with this. So you can be crazily writing, but let me take you to the honey ant. And um, honey ants are beautiful. They actually, they actually have honey like a bee's honey, but they have it in their, can you say this on Sabbath in Pathfinders? Like what's the word, backside? Um, at the back of them, uh, they have a sack and it fills up with honey. And here's a picture that I've put there in the background that actually gives you a picture. And let, let me teach you a bit of how to understand Aboriginal painting. Here you can see the little honey ants. They're all gathered there. But if you look around the picture, you can see little U's, like or little, little round things. And there's, um, they actually represent people. So what, when you look at this picture uh, and to understand Aboriginal um, painting, you're sitting there and you're looking, here is a group of people with a digging stick, a stick that you dig with. Some have a digging stick, others have a collecting bowl, might be some bark or something. So there's a stick there beside someone, beside someone else, there's like a little cradle. That's like the bark that they, and they are sitting around and they are sitting around where the honey ants are and they are digging. So there's groups of people in this indigenous art um, getting, the, um, getting the, the honey ants out and, and eating them. A real delicacy, probably a bit of a dessert um, that indigenous people say, but also the honey can be used for, for, for healing as well properties. Kwandongs. Kwandong is a nut that grows on a tree. It looks like that. It's uh, traditionally a significant food source for indigenous people. Also, it's referred to as a wild peach. So, Pastor Richie, just now, a question. Yeah, uh, go ants, do you eat then in that ca case ants to get the honey? Uh, yes, you eat the back of the ant and then you let the ant go away. And I think it will, I think it, I hope it gets better. And, and, and has another bottom full of honey uh, for another day. Um, hey, the Pink Panther is from England, isn't it? Pink Panther, is that from England? Well, depending how it takes it, but probably. Pink Panther? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. What did the Pink Panther say when it stood on the ants? I don't know. Didn't, 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 didn't. didn't. Oh. Anyway, that's for those that are older in the group. Um, probably your parents. Um, here, these Kwong Nong uh, are wonderful uh, substitutes for meat. Um, the leaves and the barks of the trees were also used for ceremonial and 
um, medicinal purposes. Let's continue to go along. Here we go. Here is me with um, probably the cousin of uh, Roy, uh, the kangaroo, Dayon's kangaroo. Here is me with a little, little kangaroo. I was in a uh, board meeting at the conference office and uh, one of our directors from one of our Aboriginal schools had come in and uh, he had rescued this little kangaroo. And here he had it in a little pouch, like a, uh, a pillow, you know how your pillow case, he had it in the pillow case and he was caring and raising this kangaroo. And so in the middle of the boardroom, we'd each have a little cuddle and even um, have a bottle and feed the, the kangaroo. Um, the other picture isn't what, how he turned out, but that is kangaroo meat um, that, is, that is fed to the, probably the finest uh, restaurants in Europe. In other, words, in other words, it seems to me, Pastor Ricci, uh, being Adventist and, and kind of having the um, you know, standards when it comes to food of Adventist church, it must be really yeah. hard. As an indigenous people, there's not a lot of clean foods that are available uh, for partaking in. So I think you, Diane, if you came to live as an indigenous pe person in Australia, come to live with us, you'd be eating a lot of kwandongs. <laughs> what yeah. is that? Uh, you weren't listening before. I did, I did. All the Pathfinders were listening and you weren't. I did. That was those little red berries. Oh, okay. That are yeah, 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 yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. But kangaroo, <laughs> kangaroo meat is high, high in protein and very low in fat. Um, let's continue on. <clears throat> Tell me this. This is another quiz question for you um, because I know how clever you are and you would know this and um, you're very quick on Google. But what is the official animals that are used as the emblems of Australia? Now, I know in England, you've got the lion, is it? Uh, what are the Australian emblems? And here's the hint for you. They are actually found on the Australian coat of arms. Coat of arms. Come back to me, Pastor Dayan. All right. With any... Anyone what is there? animals that are used as emblem of Australia? We know that. Kangaroo, that's right. Well done. And there is a one more bird which can not go backwards. Is that right, Pastor Richie? Correct. They are. Yeah, you're emu, emu is that. And I an animal? Look. Yes, I'm looking for an animal. No, that's right. And also... An some... emu? Are you trying to say emu? That's right, that's right, that's right. Pastor Richie, yeah, yes. uh, thank you very an much. An emu is an animal. Yes. yes. Yes, okay. Thank you, Pastor Dayan. Correct, guys. It is the kangaroo and the emu. Our national anthem is, is also God Save the Queen officially, but our Australian national anthem is Advance Australia Fair, it's talking about Australia moving forward. These two animals are the only animals that cannot move in a backward motion that are actually picked as Australian animals to continue to show that whole concept that Australia is moving forward and is not going backwards. And here's another little interesting fact for you. They are the only emblems in any country of the world that are eaten. Most emblems are protected, whereas you can go out and eat an emu, an emu, or a, as Pastor Dayon says, or a kangaroo whenever you like. How do P Aboriginal people live and communicate and what did their communities look like? Let's have a, let's have a look at uh, that. I'll just skip some of those things. There's some things that you can eat that are meat, that are goannas, carpet snakes, kangaroos, possums, porcupines, echidnas, emus, unamus, um, and there's veggies like wild oranges, wild passion fruit, quandongs that you miss, Pastor, um, bush tomatoes, corn berries, corn flakes, no, bush bananas, um, and there's yams, there's edible grubs, like that picture you saw of that big grub, um, witchetty grubs they're called, cicadas, cicadas. Um, there's, there's also, they'll eat the gum trees, and some of you guys have seen gum trees. There's sap that comes from them, you can eat that. And then you've got the honey ants and, and those kind of things, wildflower, the nectar. But let's have a look at this. How do people live and communicate 
um, in their communities and what did they look like. We're running out of time, so we'll quickly shoot through this. Um, in their communities, the Indigenous people, and here, here it shows you another Indigenous painting or a, a sense of a painting. And when you see something like that in an Aboriginal painting, you can say, ah, here is a meeting place. There are uh, uh, people sitting around and they've come in to, to meet. They're actually in community. So that, that artwork there um, actually represents community uh, or could represent community if you wanted to use it like that. Um, humpy. A humpy is a small and temporary shelter like the picture just before, uh, made of bark and branches that the Aboriginal people would stand up against a tree and, and would keep their weathered. They didn't worry, this wasn't, they're not staying there for 20 years because the indigenous people of Australia, the Aboriginal people were nomadic people, meaning they moved all the time. They moved with the seasons. Um, they would not stay in one place and eat out all the animals and because, you know what, there wouldn't be something for them next time. So as they moved with the seasons and they followed the food trails, they would move around as a community. So those lean-tos and those humpies that you saw there um, are only meant to just look after them for a little while and then they'd build another one as, as, as they moved on. Um, often um, the... Um, uh, the young boys would sleep with the men and around the fire or the girls would sleep with, with their mothers, but mostly the children would sleep and boys especially would sleep with their mothers and around their, their mothers and that in the, and, and then when they went off for initiation to become young men, gone out into the bush to actually um, learn how to become men and taken through some ceremonial law stuff, um, business, men's business, um, that is, is still to this day kept very quiet. Uh, only if those boys that go through initiation actually know what takes place in those, in those, those, um, those, um, those times. They would come back from being initiated and they would not stay with the mothers anymore. They would actually then camp with the men. Um, the communication... The message stick was a form of communication traditionally used by Aboriginal people, solid piece of wood, um, and it would be passed along and, um, and, and shared with, um, uh, it'd be sent. And, and some, at times it would go for long distances between different groups, different clans as they talk. You can continue to go back and look at this to fill out your paperwork. Um, I'm just gonna keep moving forward because we are running out of time. What is a corroboree? Um, there is a little frog in Australia that's endangered. It's called the corroboree frog. And it's called the corroboree frog because it actually sounds like a corroboree. It sounds like the didgeridoo. Um, let's move here and let's just watch, watch, have a look at this. This is what a corroboree uh, dance is about. Corroboree is where they come together in ceremony and they tell the stories of dream times. They tell the stories and they pass those stories down. We tend to write down stuff and we, we pass it down through literature, but the indigenous people of Australia were storytellers, um, would sit around the old people, would tell the stories and be hand down through an oral, an oral way and also through dance. And, and here you'll see that take place. <laughs> So he So here there's where you see uh, a dance, a typical dance and, and a story time that was done for the general public there at a, at a, at a program that was happening in the city. But um, that would normally be done in a corroboree area, um, in a community, and they would come around, the fires would be lit at night, and, and they would tell the stories and pass down 
the stories by dance and and by involvement and the old people would teach the young and they would dance and the women would dance and the men would dance and the children would dance and this is how they would come and do they they would do cultural uh, ceremonies and also um, when they have welcome to country and stuff like that that bring and that have a corroboree or uh, that and and when they just want to get together and and pass down the stories um now what is aboriginal law and this is the badge oh this is the um uh, the honor that you are that you're actually are going for in in doing this this afternoon and um because when we say law it's actually spelled a different way and it, sometimes it gets confused with the word law um but the term law refers to the customs and stories the Aboriginal people learned in the dream time. Um, the dream time was, um, was the Abri Aboriginal law was passed on through generation, through songs and stories and dance, and it all governed all aspects of the traditional life. Um, the difference between law and law is that law means a rule or a collection of rules. Colloquially, the law is mean, it means the police, Law is the knowledge or traditions passed down from generation to generation. Um, so when when you're when you have this badge um, on and and get and get this honour, it's actually not about the law as police and how, and keeping the rules and stuff like that. It's actually about Aboriginal um, storytelling and dream time, and it's about how they would pass down their customs and their heritage and and how they would pass it on down through to the next generation so to speak um dream time un the understanding dream time is the understanding of the creation story of the world through the eyes of aboriginal australians the dream time is an aboriginal understanding of the world of its creation and the great stories the dream time is the beginning of knowledge and uh, from where, from which came the laws of existence. The dreaming was the old time of the ancient ancestors' beginnings. They emerged from the earth at the time of creation. So that's what dream timing and, and you see this and, and animals and, and totems and all this play into it. There's stories um, that I've seen and that gets told to children about the rainbow serpent and, and how the kangaroo got its pouch and, and, and so many different, different stories um, that are about the dreaming and the dream time. Um, what are some artifacts, articles of, of trade exchanged? The, the natural sort of things that you would think of, stone axes and boomerangs, tools or weapons, and would be used for, they would, they would use, find pearls from the coastal areas and trade them because of the shininess of them. Um, uh, rocks and even ochre. Ochre is, is um, the, the, uh, the dirt that they, they spit in or they put water in and mix it up to do the face painting or to do paintings on rocks or the paintings that you saw, some different weapons that are used, um, spears and, and clubs, shields, boomerangs. Um, you've seen people throw boomerangs, I would imagine, um, and they can be used for either fighting or hunting. And they would have different, you, a boomerang is something you throw out and, 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 and it, it, it's supposed to come back. I saw Pastor Dayon throw one once and um, it never came back. Um, different kinds of Aboriginal art. Um, you've got rock paint. Um, and here's, here's, here's a picture over on the side there of some rock painting. Um, dot painting. You've seen some of that dot painting before. Uh, rock engraving, bark painting, carving, sculptures and weaving and string art. These are the kinds of artwork. And here are some, some different ones. You can see there's some weaving there with the different colors and they would soak those in the ochre um, solutions. That would be the red dirt and, and, and different colors and stuff there. You see some bark, there's some bark there, there's some weaving and there's some dot art. There's that dot art that we saw on the first 
uh, first page with the, the, the coolabar trees, the crabs, the kangaroos, the emus, barolgas, and goennas. Let me just quickly share with you some of the history of the people since. And, and this is probably the sad part of, of the honour and the sad part of history. And, and I, I don't think there's a place in this world until we reach um, heaven where peace and, um, and kindness will properly abound. And, um, and, and though Australia is a beautiful place, it also has a dark past um, since colonisation. Um, earlier in the, in, in the um, uh, colonisation, when, as, when uh, the British came, um, there, was, there was fights and um, they rounded up Aboriginal people. Um, they was, the Aboriginal people were scared of, of the, the British and the, the, the colonialists. And, and so they were also scared of them and they tried to trade with them. And there's places where in, in Australia's history where they actually, um, uh, genocide actually took place. Um, you don't sort of think of that in beautiful Australia, that, that, that there's a history of genocide. But there is actually where um, Aboriginals were rounded up and actually pushed off cliffs. Um, they were rounded up and shot. Um, they were they were they were um, killed for sport, and uh, and they were they were they were chained up like these some of these pictures that are that can't tell lies. Um, these pictures of 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 how they they were actually treated and and put to work, and um, and um, they were uh, relocated. They were families were broken up. And um, children were removed, and um, I don't know if you've you've heard in Australia they talk about the stolen generation, where children were actually removed from their from from their their parents, um, and 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 it is a history full of hurt. It's a history full of loss, and it's a history full of pain. And um, and even even myself, Pastor Richie here, who's talking to you this the, this afternoon. Um, I was actually removed from my family um, because my family couldn't care, uh, give me adequate care, and I was placed into, and, and this is where I thank God um, for, there was a Seventh-day Adventist family who picked up the phone and said, bring those two Aboriginal boys around. There's, there's room in our, in our foster home for them. And so I was fostered into a Seventh-day Adventist Christian home for where I spent the rest of all of my life, and still today, um, I call the mum and dad, my brothers and sisters. They're 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 a white Australian family, um, and 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 that's a little just a little bit of my story um, is also about um, loss and and a loss of my culture um, through through that transition because I was never placed with a, an Aboriginal family, an Indigenous family, a First Nations family. I was placed into a white home, and so it's recognised that there is a loss for me in my, um, my cultural identity and who, and, and who I am as a person. That's something that I have to go through and look for and, and to share with my, my children, uh, my girls. And, um, and that's a journey that I have to go on if I want to do that. Um, but um, so many people have been hurt and uh, families ripped apart. Um, there was, I told you that I was from a government reserve um, what happened was when they removed children, when they separated families, they moved and the state, the, the, the white Australian um, people believed that they knew better how to care for Indigenous people than the Indigenous people did themselves. And, uh, and so they set up reserves, the government reserves, and then the churches thought, well, we want to help there. We see the disadvantage in that. And the churches came and helped, and they they called those missions. So if you're at a government, if you're at a reserve, that meant it was being cared for by the government. If you're on a, on a mission, that was be, the churches were looking after it. Both of those institutions, whether it be government reserves or churches, have actually really um, played a lot into the damage of the Indigenous First Nations people in this country because of of. The, the strictness um, of those, the abuse that took place in those institutions, the removal, 
um, um, the breaking up of family, um, the taking of children. There was um, here, you can see um, some of the pictures. You see, yes, it says there, vote yes. Um, there was a date, 1967, and um, some of your parents were alive in 1967. Um, some of your parents, your grandparents were. But in 1967, that wasn't that long ago, but that was a date when Australia had a referendum, a referendum, a vote, and that vote was to allow Australian Aboriginals, Indigenous Australians, me, my family, my ancestors, my grandparents, my parents for that matter, uh, First Nations people were allowed, the, the Australians took a vote to allow us to actually have Australian citizenship. Before 1967, Aboriginal people, Richie, Pastor Richie here, my family, any, any Indigenous person was actually referred to as fora and flora. So we were categorised as the same with the animals or the, the flowers and those kinds of things. That's how terrible history was. Um, and that's where the hurt, some of the hurts and the pain, I can't go into all of it this afternoon with you, but that gives you a little picture about in 1967, that's not that long ago, um, Australian Aboriginals didn't, weren't even recognised in their own country as, as, as Australian. Um, times moved on from that. And um, here's a little, a little video which gives you an understanding. This is a, a movie um, that comes from, from Australia. It's, a, it's called The Rabbit Proof Fence. There's a fence in Australia that runs all the way down, longest fence in the world, and it's to keep the rabbits out. You thought the, Chinese, the Great Wall of China was to keep the rabbits out. No, this fence was to keep, it's called The Rabbit Proof Fence to, for the farming land to keep the rabbits that, that um, they brought here and, and the rabbits went crazy and, and spread and they built this fence and this story is about these children who were removed from their family, from Jigalong. They were taken thousands of kilometres down um, south of Western Australia um, and are put into an, a, a mission, a church-run mission. And this is a story about how these girls, they escaped and ran away from the mission and they knew that this fence line that they found down near the mission they knew that, they, and they were told that was a rabbit proof fence. And they knew that that fence ran through their town back up at Jigalong. And they followed that fence all the way. And, and the movie, it's a true story of how these girls made their way home to their families and they followed the rabbit proof fence through the heat and the exhaustion of Australia. Really good movie for you to see. It gives you an insight. I'm going to show you a little bit of it. It gives you the, I guess, the raw emotion about the kind of things that were, were taking Pastor place. Uh, Pastor yeah. Richard, but just a question. Is it maybe possible for us to have a look at that after the presentation? Yeah, you, you can have a look at that afterwards. Just because of um, time, that, that's all it is. How are, we going, how are we going? Come for, and get your back. How are we going for time? <clears throat> how are we going for time there? Uh, so we don't have a lot. Yeah. yeah okay. We, yeah. Well, I'm just about finished here. So you can go back and have a look at that video. But let me tell you this, there is hope for the future, uh, but we still have a long way to go. Um, indigenous people today, um, the actual government, uh, just a number of years ago, actually got up in front of parliament and Australia watched its television and turned its radios on, turned on the internet to watch the prime minister stand up and apologize to the indigenous people of Australia for the atrocities, uh, the genocide, the problems, this, the stolen generation, all the issues that were there. He apologised on behalf of the Australian Parliament um, to the nation. That went part of the way to healing. There's so much more healing, and I don't think true healing will come until we, we, all, we all go to heaven because there's so much hurt in that. But there is, there is hope in a future. We see Aboriginal people in the sports um, stars. We see movie stars. We see them rising up. They're given opportunities in education, and these are good things. The history of the church um, with the church here in Australia has been involved with Indigenous ministries for uh, for a um, hundred years. Just a couple of years ago, hundred years of of 
And uh, here we have in, in Australia, in, in, the, in the church, in every conference of Australia and the union, we have a department that is, is there for the indigenous people and, and an indigenous person is, 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 is the head of that department. Um, we have six ordained Seventh-day Adventist ministers. Um, we have two to 3,000 uh, members that are indigenous. Um, the the 2011-2016 census in Australia showed that, uh, that the Seventh-day Adventist church were, um, the, grew by 25% in their Aboriginal work. We're the fastest growing work within the church when it comes to baptisms and membership. Um, we have a, a Bible college. We have a school, um, Carolundi School, which is just near that rabbit-proof fence. Actually, is there's a world record. It has the longest bus route in the world. Um, the kids that go to that school, um, the bus run that goes and picks them up. Um, but we have a Bible college and a, a health college that is is turning out people, Indigenous people, to spread the Adventist message and the and and the message of of a reconciliation through Jesus Christ and what he's done uh, for us. Um, time has gone. Pastor Dayon? Pastor, do you have any more uh, slides do you have? And um... this, is, this, this is just the finish of it. You okay. can watch, you can go back and watch this. This is a video of Mamaratha College. Um, and that tells you, this is a video that was made for next week in Australia, in the union. Um, the, all the offering, offerings that will be collected next week in Australia will be going to support Pastor, the, show the, us the, the video. Bible. Sorry? Well, show us a little bit of a video. I'll show you a little bit. There you go. Nestled in a small country town in the Perth Hills District, Mamarafa College is a vibrant faith community that trains and equips Indigenous Australians for ministry. Owned and operated by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Mamarafa College has been training and serving Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in gospel ministry and health ministry for 24 years. From here, students extend the borders of the college all across Australia, from bustling cities to remote communities. Right now, Mamarafa is impacting over 200 towns, suburbs and communities all across Australia. As students return to their communities and share their Mamarafa experience, family and friends attest to the spiritual transformation that Mamarafa ignites. Students also gain qualifications that equip them with valuable skills and knowledge that can help them practically wherever they minister. As a result, the number of student applications continues to grow. Okay. I'll leave it there, Pastor Dayan. I'll leave it there for, for, for you guys. Uh, that comes to the end of our, our, our honour this afternoon. If you want to know any more information, uh, get in touch with um, Pastor Dayan and he'll be able to put you onto us here in Australia or he'll be able to um, share with us. And, uh, and I want to thank you guys. Just before you go, Pastor Dayan, can you just okay. um, go back to that screen? Can I just oh, share sorry, that I screen again? Uh, you, you have to do it yourself. You just press uh, share screen um, and then you can go back to this. I, just, I thought uh, we, uh, because we wanted to see you. Oh, excellent, Pastor Richie, we're there, yes. All right, let me, let me just show you this. This is a video. Um, about you guys coming and visiting us in Australia. It was made by our tourism department. Thanks very much. Well, the Australian Tourist Commission has asked us to come up with a song that we could perform overseas, a song to help bring the tourists back to Australia. That's right. So we focused on the wonderful wildlife and the fabulous fauna that Australia has to offer. Red back funnel with blue ring octopus, taipan, tiger snake, and a box jellyfish, stonefish, and the poison thing that lives in a shell that spikes you when you pick it up. Come to Australia, you might accidentally get killed. Your life's constantly under threat. 
have you been bitten yet? You've only got three minutes left before a massive coronary breakdown. Red back funnel with blue ring, octopus, taipan, tiger snake, adder box, jellyfish, beach shark. Just waiting for you to go swimming at Bondi Beach. Come on, come to Australia. You might accidentally get killed. Your blood is bound to be spilled. With fear, your pants will be filled. Because you might accidentally get killed. All right, there you go. Come to Australia but we'll look after you. Thank you, Pastor Richie. Uh, and uh, we are very thankful uh, uh, for your time. And uh, uh, of course, uh, it's almost one o'clock, if not after one as, uh, in the morning for you. We would like to say a big thank you. So let's be, give a clap together for Pastor Richie. I'm gonna allow you to unmute yourself uh, so that uh, we can say, uh, show our appreciation. Thank, thank you, Pastor Richie. Thank you, thank you. 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 Thank